Good afternoon. It's five after 12, so it's afternoon now. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today, uh, talking about such an important topic in such an important week of the year. Uh, this week is, or today in particular, is uh, World Mental Health Day. And uh, we're bringing you expertise from our counseling department. Jeffrey Glenn is gonna be doing a presentation on cognitive distortions, how thinking errors shape our experiences. Um, I would like to start by uh, um, acknowledging this beautiful land that we're on, uh, that is uh, welcomed here by the families of the Kwasopsimung and Lekwungen families. Um, it's a pleasure to live, work, play, interact, build relationships, and take care of ourselves and take care of each other on this land. So we're very fortunate to be here, and we acknowledge that. Um, so this community learning opportunity is uh, delivered in cooperation with human resources because it is a community concern. So our well-being staff and students are important to each other so that we can thrive and make the most out of the learning opportunities that we have here. Um, today is also Light Up Purple for Mental Health Day, hence purple cupcakes. <laughs> Purple shirts, thank you so much. I see so much purple in the audience, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, and this is our launch of the long-awaited pamphlet of a student mental health framework. So pick one up uh, at the table on the way out or buy the cupcakes if you haven't grabbed a cupcake or on the way out. Um, this <laughs> highlights the key points of the framework and what to do if you see a student or a peer or uh, somebody who is in distress. So. Keep this handy on your desktop, and it's something that we would love you to incorporate in everything that we do here. Um, so I'm going to hand it over now to Jeffrey Glenn, who is our uh, one of our counselors and a registered clinical counselor. Um, and I'm so excited to learn what he has to say about cognitive distortion. Thanks, everybody. It's good to see a, a mix. There's a good mix of students and staff. And, and uh, the, the beautiful part about that is that in terms of mental health day or week, you know, mental health is not something that we just sort of fix. It's, it's something that we do. It's something that we're always trying to work on, all of us. It's not something that just some people deal with. Uh, so this is, uh, this is great to have a nice turnout, and it's an honor to be able to represent our team in terms of sharing some stuff that I hope will be helpful for you, both personally, professionally, and in all spheres of life. Uh, in terms of just an introduction today, a little bit of background about me. Um, I've been here about 10 months, so I haven't been here very long. Uh, before coming here, uh, I worked in the EAP area for about six years, uh, but the majority of my career is actually working in corrections uh, with parole. Um, and in parole, we do a lot of CBT work, which is where a lot of the basis of my, my work in this area came from. So we'll go over a bit of a brief introduction, a little bit about cognitive behavioral therapy and how it works. Then we'll go into the 10 most common cognitive distortions or thinking errors that we see highly correlated with mental health challenges like anxiety, depression, uh, interpersonal conflict. Um, and then we're gonna try to talk a little bit about some ways to try to counter those thinking errors or how to untwist those thinking patterns. At the end, I hope to have time to give you guys a Q&A period and uh, ask any questions you have, and, uh, and that'll be a bit out about it, okay? Hopefully you guys got a muffin or a cupcake, and uh, we'll get going. So you guys might have noticed I, I had some, pa some papers out because I wanted to kind of get a, a sense of a few things and to exhibit something. So as I've written up there, I just want to take a poll, and I don't want you to overthink this. Put your hand up if you tend to believe that situations or external circumstances in your life have dictated your responses? The majority, okay. There were certain themes to this exercise where I asked people to tell me how they felt walking in here today. And I found five sort of themes. Curious, okay, felt okay. Excited, fantastic, or anxious. Now, if situations dictated your emotional responses, how is it possible that you had all these different feelings even though you guys are experiencing the exact same event right now? <laughs> Did I just debunk this thought that you had? This cause and effect relationship. Now, a lot of people tend to think in those ways. And it can create a lot of frustration or anxiety or powerlessness because we're giving a lot of power away to things beyond our control to dictate who we are, how we respond to things. 
So today we're going to talk about all the different influences that actually are underpinning our reactions and how we can do something about those. So what is CBT and how does it work? CBT is a collaborative form of psychotherapy that focuses on how a person's thoughts, feelings, and attitudes shape their feelings and behaviors. CBT has been proven effective in working with a wide range of mental health challenges and some of the things I already touched on, anxiety, depression, pain management, personality disorders. It's been very effective in a lot of different domains. Now, if we were to think about the impact of thinking and, and think about this as almost a fork in the road of two different types of maybe students that we might see here. We have an upcoming exam. The top one has a healthy thought or self-talk that says, you know what, I've studied hard, I'm feeling prepared, I'm good to go. So they go into that exam room and they're feeling a healthy sense of stress, but they're calm, they're confident, they're focused in the right ways, and their mind is open and, and capable of being able to show the work they've put out. Now, the bottom is the other end of things. Self-talk that says, I'm not ready for this, what if I fail? What follows that? Anxiety, fear, stress. And whenever we're stressed or in a fear-based survival mentality, we tend to not be able to access our higher brain function. We lock up, we have that mental fog or, or feeling frozen. I highlighted, as you can see there, the, the what if component, because what if is a huge, huge issue when we look at anxiety. Anxiety is all about a future-focused, worry-based, out-of-control mental game that we play with ourselves, And we don't tend to focus our what-ifs on anything good. It'll be, you know, and we'll, we'll, we'll often catastrophize. Well, if I fail this exam, then I won't be able to get a high enough GPA, and then I won't be able to get into the graduate school I want to, and then my parents will be disappointed with me, and I'm going to end up working at McDonald's and eventually homeless and dead on the street. And these thoughts can bang, 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 quick. You can see it. They go. The funny thing is that the, like, I often, when I talk to clients, they don't usually look in the crystal ball and focus on what ifs that are good. You know what I mean? Like they don't, they, don't, they don't play the tape out in a positive way. They tend to do it in the negative way where they imagine their nightmare scenario. And then to no surprise, they get overwhelmed and fearful. I don't remember, like say when I was a student, you know, being 20, 21, going out on a Friday night, thinking to myself, what if I'm just too handsome? <laughs> like, what, what if I just bring too much heat to the dance floor and I get inundated with so much attention that my friends get jealous and I gotta handle all these numbers coming at me? Like, I never, I never worried about things like that. I worried about, it. and again, I would think more like, oh, if I, don't, if I don't get a number, then I'm not going to get a girlfriend. If I don't get a girlfriend, then I'm going to be a joke, and then I'm going to die alone. You know, we often end up at, I'm going to die alone at the end of these sort of fear-based catastrophes. <laughs> so cognitive distortions uh, are simply ways that our mind convinces us of facts that aren't necessarily true. So these inaccurate thoughts or assumptions are usually used to reinforce negative thinking or patterns or emotions, telling ourselves things that sound rational and logical in the moment, but often just serve to keep us feeling bad about ourselves or powerless about our future. Come on in. <laughs> Find a seat. You haven't missed too much. Okay. So the first cognitive distortion is one of the really classic ones, and that's called all or nothing thinking. Sometimes we call this black or white thinking. Uh, basically thinking in dichotomous ways, thinking in extremes. Um, so good versus bad, right versus wrong, good versus evil, stones or beetles. You know, like, the, like you can't have both, right? You gotta, you gotta, you gotta pick a side. Um, you're either with me or against me. Obviously this is gonna create a lot of tension with people in our life if we tend to be uh, so inflexible in our position. The other way shows up in terms of perfectionism. Uh, if I'm not perfect, I've failed, or for Talladega Nights fans, Ricky Bobby, if you're not first, you're last, right? Um, you know, for, there's a lot of high-functioning students and staff here, I'm sure, who are kind of wired this way, and I don't want to suggest that it's, it's like all bad. There's some brilliant artists and students and people who just like, they only have one gear, and it's, you know, crank it to 11. But the problem is it does burn out, and it does make 
their sense of identity a little fractured when things don't go perfect, when they make mistakes. Um, for anyone who, who's ever you know, become that way about getting in shape, trying to drop a few pounds, I mean, they can go perfect maybe for two weeks or three weeks, but the problem is the minute all of a sudden you have that one scoop of ice cream, we've gone from perfect to failure. So shame follows quickly and self-talk that says, oh, I've blown it now, I might as well go all the way <laughs> and then eat the whole quart of ice cream. And now we're just, we've totally swung the pendulum the wrong way. So we have to be careful that, with that. We need to be able to think in shades of gray. We need to be able to uh, sort of identify success in different ways and not be so dichotomous as this or that. I'm sure you guys have been privy to, while well, we're coming up to political debates. You can see value in maybe all of them. It doesn't have to be a he's all brilliant, he's all dumb. He's great, she's bad. Like, we don't need to do that. So, so we want to be able to see that there's room for both and, in terms of the gray in between. Overgeneralization. Viewing a single negative event as a never-ending pattern of defeat by using words such as always or never when you think about it. We see this a lot in conflict, uh, specifically when I would work with couples. As resentment and tensions build, we tend to get very dramatic with our language. So this, this sort of things like this happens every time. You never have my back with your mother. You always let me down. You're never, like, we, we do this at language, and then it's not surprising that we have, with intense loaded language, we have intense loaded emotion that follows. Because listen to the story that gets told. And you can imagine me sitting there with a couple who's doing this. Well, you never do this. Well, I always do that. Chances are there are exceptions to the rule, and that language isn't really reflecting reality. So I would often be challenging them to say, well, are you saying that that's, <laughs> without exception, that person's never chosen you over his friends? Or is this, does this really happen every time? In which case the person might say, well, no. <laughs> so then I might ask, okay, well then can you say, use language that reflects reality then? I think sometimes you do that. On occasion I've noticed that. It's really hard to get jacked up emotionally when you're using words like, sometimes I think you do this. <laughs> every now and again you let me down. Like, because it implies that sometimes you're not that and you actually are kind of a, a good partner, maybe. Mental filter. Only paying attention to certain types of evidence while ignoring others. So a tendency to pick out a single negative detail and dwell on it exclusively, noticing only the perceived failures or flaws, like the drop of ink that discolors a beaker of water. Now, if I was to ask you guys again as a poll, let's say that you give a presentation to a group of associates at work. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you get tons of positive feedback, uh, except that one person gives some mild criticism. Would you focus on all the positive feedback, or would you, <laughs> would you spin on the one negative comment? I think a lot of us are guilty of this. The question is why. Why, if I had 10 people, nine applaud me, say I'm brilliant, one says, mm, why do we do that? Does anyone have any ideas of why we would do that? From an analytical point of view, it makes no sense, right? My belief in terms of experience would suggest that human beings walk around with a confirmation bias. What we believe to be true, we tend to notice evidence for in terms of supporting it. If we battle insecurity, if we battle shame, if we battle self-doubt, if we tell ourselves it wasn't good enough, then we will cast out those other comments. We will find a way to diminish them, and we will solely focus on the one comment that's backed our belief. It wasn't good enough. Now, there might be a few of you out there that don't operate this way, and to that I say congratulations. That's fantastic. The reason I think some of you who don't battle that have that is that you probably have a very positive sort of self-concept or have a lot more compassion for yourself. So I know that there could be a scenario where the same per the, a different person who has a lot of that self-confidence could give the exact same presentation, get the exact same feedback that the other scenario had, but come out of it going, nine out of 10 people knew what I knew. I was awesome, it was great. I don't know what's going on with the other guy. Maybe something's going on with him, I don't know. 
But those people, they know. Nailed it. <laughs> so, so they will focus on what backs their opinion and their sense of how it went. Discounting the positive plays on the same thing. Rejecting positive experiences by insisting they don't count. In other words, it wasn't good enough. Again, some perfectionism in there. It was good, but it wasn't good enough. Or anyone could have done as well, so don't give me praise. It's no big deal. Um, again, maybe I got lucky. Uh, this was just the exception. Normally, I'm a failure, but I did okay this time. Uh, these people are just being nice. They're just you know, being thoughtful. They didn't actually like what I did or the presentation I gave. Discounting the positive takes the, the joy and the, and the sense of accomplishment away from our, from our, um, our achievements. And they can often just perpetuate the same narrative that we carry about, about ourselves. So we have to be careful about how we manipulate information that way and discount even some of our greatest achievements. Jumping to conclusions. There are two main ways that we do this. Mind reading, imagining we know what others are thinking or what their true motivations are or fortune telling, predicting that things will turn out badly in the future. Now most people, if I was to ask one-on-one -on -one in a session, they would at least have one of these where they're like, yeah, I kind of do that a little bit. <laughs> I, do. Um, I think that we all mind read to a degree. Um, but how many people, if I asked in terms of the whole room, how many people get caught up sometimes mind reading? And we don't do it for nefarious reasons. We, just, we, we tend to just assume. We, we take in little bits of information, and then we flood the gaps with our, with our assumptions and our beliefs, and then we just create a story that seems cohesive and rational. Um, but I, mean, I think we've all been in a, in a situation where, a social scene where you, know, you walk into a room and everyone goes quiet. And we go immediately, <laughs> they're talking about me, and it's probably about the comment I made in the meeting, and oh God, or I took the last donut of the thing, and now they're judging me. Like, we just like, create this whole story, and it can seem very, very real. And in a corporate or work environment, if that doesn't get checked out right away, it can be toxic to the environment if it never gets clarified. Because that person's story might just totally make you out to be a terrible person, or, or vice versa. And uh, so it's important to realize any of those miscommunications or lack of information can be flooded and make a mess. Fortune telling really comes back to the, the root of anxiety again. Looking in the crystal ball, seeing all the, all the things that are going to go wrong, and then trying to control the uncontrollable. Magnification and minimization, exaggerating the importance or magnitude of your problems and shortcomings, or minimizing the value or importance of your desirable, desirable qualities. So this is also called the binocular trick. So the first one is a little more, for lack of a more appropriate term, more of a, a, a drama queen kind of thing. Someone who really wants to be able to exaggerate and, 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 and make it more, uh, more verbose and a bigger issue. Whereas the other one, yeah, is more just like uh, silencing and sort of diminishing uh, what, what's good or what's, what's actually working well for them in their life. Emotional reasoning. Assuming that because we feel a certain way, that it must be true or reflect the way things really are. So for example, I feel terrified about going on airplanes. It must be very dangerous to fly. I feel angry. This proves that I'm being treated unfairly. I feel hopeless, I must really be hopeless. I feel guilty, I must be a rotten person. The problem with this is that fundamentally it's flawed and it's just, it's a little bit backwards. The exercise I had you guys do today is really about realizing that my thoughts are influencing my feelings. And I'm not saying that feelings don't influence thoughts either, because they do. The relationship between thoughts, feelings, and behaviors are always working. But what I would say, say with the first one there about flying, I would say that the person feels terrified about going on airplanes because they believe it's dangerous to fly. Whereas in this example, they're using their emotion as a rationalization for the situation. So we need to be careful of this. Um, I feel like an idiot, I must be one. This is a very flawed logic. Should statements. You tell yourself that things should be the way you hoped or expected them to be. Uh, other common words that are in this realm that are, that are also issues, musts, oughts, and have tos are similar offenders. So should statements that are directed against ourselves tend to lead to guilt and frustration. 
Should statements that are directed against other people or the world in general often lead to anger and conflict? Albert Ellis has called this masturbation. <laughs> David Burns, who was sort of the godfather of CBT, called it a shitty approach to life. Now, what's the problem with shoulds? Why is should a problem? Absolutely, it's judgmental. Can you, can you add to that? What, why is the judgment wrong? Why is it flawed? It's unrealistic, I would say. Sure. Because it's one-dimensional, right? It's, it's sort of unilateral. It's your, your judgment. Yeah? It points out that there's a wrong way where you shouldn't do it. That's, That's right. right. And if you yeah. that, then you're in the wrong and you have to feel bad about yourself. Ah, good connection. Yes? It takes your power away. Yeah. And it definitely does if we use it on someone else, right? So should is a, is a problem because it's very closed. If I, if, I, if I asked any one of you, like if you came into my office and we had a chat and at the end I said to you, okay, I think I have a pretty good sense of what's going on in your life and I've decided what you should do with your career and marriage. <laughs> now, that, that uncomfortable laughter <laughs> is, is, is a natural one. Although I do get the odd person who I, when I, I ask that, they'll be like, tell me, please. Tell me, like, <laughs> I'm coming here because I want you to tell me what to do. And then I'm like, a, yeah, exactly. And I was like, I'm not an advice giver or an all-knowing wizard. Um, but so it's a problem, yes, because who am I or anyone to tell someone what they should do as if they know or there's only one right answer? Same thing when we use should on ourselves. It's really not open. It's not uh, curious. It's not flexible. Now, if I was to say the same thing, I know I'm looking at you guys, so I'll just, okay. So if I said to you, okay, well, I think I have a pretty good sense of what's going on. Uh, and I have a few ideas that you could try. Does, do, doesn't, doesn't feel so, <laughs> like, you know. Um, and basically just replacing should with could is the biggest distinction there because could is open, could is flexible. Could doesn't even suggest that you need to go with the things I'm offering. Maybe there's some other ideas that would be just as valuable if not more effective. So be careful of shoulds. It's very closed, it's very judgmental as you guys said. Labeling. Assigning labels to ourselves or others. Instead of focusing on specific behaviors, we attach a negative label to ourselves, let's just such as fool or loser or jerk. These are really useless abstractions because there's no such thing. There's human beings, but there's no such thing as a fool or a loser or a jerk. Um, when directed against ourselves, tend to lead to feelings of shame, low self-esteem, and hopelessness and to improve things because we wear it as a character flaw. As opposed to just I I behaved like an idiot which we've all done. That was a jerk move I made there. Notice that these are about behavior. Good people do bad things sometimes. And I know I'd hate to be defined by my worst moment, but sometimes the labels will do that. Think about a bad first impression we make. If someone, or if we do it to them, attach that label to our forehead, it can be tattooed on there for a long time and it can be hard to see that person in an objective, fair way because we've already decided you're this type of person. I don't do well with that type of character. So we need to be careful with it. And in terms of the difference between guilt and shame, Brene Brown talks about that guilt is about behavior, shame is about character. I did wrong versus I am wrong. And labeling is a dangerous way, especially even if we do it in our own self-talk. I'm such an idiot, I'm such a moron. I'm so we need to be careful about that because it starts to become true because we've said it so many times. And we definitely need to be conscientious if we come with any trauma background or abuse in our experiences because those can implant some of those beliefs about ourselves too. And then again, that confirmation bias and negative labeling can notice examples where we go, ah, oh, there it is again, I must really be this. I must really be hopeless or an idiot or whatever. So as you're picking up on, the more of these things we do, the more they tend to play off each other and they tend to sort of support uh, that sense of functioning. Personalization and blame. Personalization occurs when you blame yourself for something that wasn't totally under your control, may not have been your responsibility or, or, or at all your fault. So for example, uh, my child is having difficulties at school to make the leap or personalization there that I guess this means I'm a bad parent. They wouldn't be having difficulties at school if I was a good parent, so it must be me. It falls on me. 
Blaming is on the other end of the spectrum. Blaming your circumstances or other people for your situation without taking responsibility for your own role in it. Blame is like a game of hot potato. No one wants to get stuck with it. When you think about these things, think about them on a spectrum. Blame, personalization. And because we're not working in all or nothings, right? <laughs> we're going to think about this. Now, we'd all like to achieve or, or, or like to see ourselves in some like well boundaried personally responsible middle ground, but the reality is we tend to tip one way or another, and not all the time. There's a lot of people I know who would say, I take a heightened sense of like, responsibility where maybe I don't need to um, at work, but at home I tend to blame. Sometimes it might be across the board. I tend to tip this way everywhere. So I would encourage all of you to kind of think about that a little bit in terms of like, where do I tend to go when I'm most wounded? Do I tend to take on and try to people please or caretake and just say, oh, no, it's me, it's my fault, I'll own it? Or do we tend to push that responsibility away? And if you notice it, then there's something you can do about it in terms of trying to catch that and bring it back into the center a little bit more. So how to challenge your thoughts in a healthy way. Healthy self-talk is, 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 is important and it comes with a, a sense of curiosity. Empathy for yourself or anyone else comes with it, that curiosity to try to understand as opposed to have judgments or label or, or judge in such a way. So am I thinking realistically? Is this thought even helpful? So to stay curious rather than judgmental. Do I have evidence to show that my thinking is reflecting reality? Or am I just creating a story and using sort of pseudo evidence that doesn't really fit to, to, to put together this argument or position? What is the worst that can happen? Hassle or horror? In other words, we can be, again, dramatic with language at times. We can say things like, if I don't get that job or, or if I don't get a date in the next year, I'm just going to die. You know, like we, we can be very dramatic. So to be able to realize that at times, you know, there could be outcomes that, yeah, we have a job interview, we want to get it. It would be, it would be disappointing, it would hurt, um, it would be a hassle. But we want to be careful of not being too dramatic and, and turning it into an absolute horror because what will follow then is stress and anxiety uh, and panic attacks and things like that. How would I honestly rate this problem from zero to 100? So in terms of thinking in shades of gray, if you tend to be a little black or white or all or nothing, find a mechanism like pros and cons, um, using a number system, zero to 100. There's a lot of different ways where you can maybe take a step back and really assess where does this actually fit on a spectrum to assess how damaging or unhealthy the situation is. Is my thoughts based on feeling rather than fact? Again, am I, am I creating a story that's just based on how I feel? One pet peeve I have as a therapist. People tend to describe their, their thoughts, but they frame them as feelings. And I think this is a new thing in the last like 10, 20 years. You see it in uh, some dark comedies with couples where they'll do the banter back and forth like, well, I just feel like you're a total arsehole. I just feel like you don't listen to me. I just feel like when you did that, you should have done that. And they, so they say all these things and they frame it as a feeling, but they're not actually sharing their feelings. They're just sharing an opinion. So I'll give you an example. One very, very difficult couple. Uh, the one person was saying these dramatic things like, I, uh, I, I just I feel like you've never loved me. I feel like you're probably socking money away. And I, and I, and I just feel like you're probably having an affair with my sister and are going to run off and, and move away or whatever. Steal our kids. <laughs> Now, you can anticipate that the reaction is not, is not, a, not a welcome one by the partner. But when I heard this, I said, okay, well, we need, to, we need to kind of slow this down a little bit because you actually didn't share a feeling at all. You just shared some thoughts. So I'm not telling you how to think and I'm not telling you how to feel. But if that's actually what you think about your, your partner, then say it again, but really own it. Own it that this, this is what you think is going on. And when it came time, a person couldn't look across and actually say, I think you've never loved me. I think you don't respect me. I think you're going to have an affair with my sister and run off to Barbados. Could not say that. Because there was a certain sense of ownership with, I think that. There's a weird sort of freedom or lack of accountability that comes when we use fluffy language like, I just feel like, or I feel that. Because it seems like we can say anything. 
And then when the person gets upset, we can be like, well, I'm not saying, I'm just saying I felt like that a little bit. <laughs> I'm not accusing, I'm just, I, just, I just feel like that's happening right now. So that's not a feeling. So as a general rule, I always would say, you can say, I think that, and whatever comes after is your business. That's your opinion. You can have an, I think that. Own it, that's what you think. And you can say, I feel blank. In other words, I feel sad, I feel pain in my leg, I feel hungry, and no one can debate that. What I don't think is a healthy way of using language is, I feel that, or I feel like. Because I know what's gonna come after is an opinion. And it's gonna be framed in a way that's gonna cause conflict. So, does that make sense? So be careful of this distinction between thoughts and feelings and the way that we communicate them. One big one here in terms of self-compassion and perspective, how would I speak to a friend in this situation? This is also called the double standard method. There are so many high-functioning people here in this school that have one set of rules and, and set of compassionate sort of uh, expectations for others that are patient, and then to themselves they don't. So I'll ask, okay, so you're in this situation, you're going through heartbreak, you're, you have this terrible housing situation, uh, you, you know, your, your mom is sick back at home, so you get all these things, and, they'll, and, and, and their perspective might just be, but, but I, I can't do this, and I shouldn't bother them, and, 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 and I should be better, and all these distorted sort of thoughts and judgments. And I'll say, well, what would you say if, if a friend came to you and was in, in the same situation? What, what would you say to them? What would be your, gui your guidance to them? And oftentimes they'd say, oh, I would give them a big hug and tell them they're doing the best they can and they can't <laughs> take the weight of the world on their shoulders. And I would just tell them they're doing great and just stay with it. But why do, do you not deserve the same level of compassion? You are in this situation. Why is there a different rule book for how it works for you than compared to anybody else? What, would I, or what am I responsible for in this situation? Uh, also, a reattribution error. Again, that kind of comes back to the personalizing again. What am I owning and what is not my responsibility to own? And it comes down to I, I am responsible for my behavior and no one else's. So to think back to this, uh, this sort of thing that we did at the beginning around stimulus and response or cause and effect ways of, of framing things. Uh, Viktor Frankl said, between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. That space might feel very small, and I know that it is. We call them knee-jerk reactions for a reason, because they feel. But we got to realize, between you know, that, that person's comment and you <laughs> yelling back was a mental and emotional processing and storytelling about what it meant. That's why, if I was to poll everyone in here, uh, there's, you know, we don't all respond the same way to a slow driver in the passing lane. It's a pet peeve of mine, I admit. But, <laughs> but for some people, they can be in that situation. And if I see them fingering the guy and flashing the lights and coming, I know that what's going on is some really creative storytelling and distorted thinking around like, this person doesn't know how to drive, they don't respect other drivers, the, this is an ignorant person. So they are just like throwing gas on the fire in terms of creating this. Whereas another person might sit there and say, you know, maybe this person's new here, maybe they're distracted, maybe their cat died, maybe they're just going through some stuff. You know what, I, I could have left earlier. It's really gonna only take an extra 10 seconds. So you know what, I'll just go around or I'll wait, whatever. Therefore, they have no emotional reaction and their behavior is not <laughs> to do it all, right? The situation is the same. I, I hate the idea that I would live in a, in a situation or live in this life where I could wake up one day feeling really, really confident in myself, uh, feeling really good, and then just like someone or something happens and it just dictates, the, no, now you're going to hate yourself. Now you're going to have anxiety. Now you're going to question your identity. Now I'm not saying that you know that I or that I uh, that that we we're all unimpacted. We are impacted by external events, but how we're impacted, the stories we tell about it, the responsibility we have for how we manage it behaviorally, those that's where our power and strength lies. It's not always easy to be that personally responsible, to say no matter what happens to me, I own my behavior. 
But what it does also mean is that if you have a moment where you go through something really hard and you handle that situation with dignity and grace, you get to own that too. As opposed to saying, I just got lucky. Or anyone would have handled it just as well. So keep that in mind. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, here's some of our information in terms of our general uh, counseling department and contact information. Um, and that is it. For, so just the Q&A <laughs> portion. <laughs> Do we have any online questions? Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Um, not yet. I've just invit invited some questions. We have 24 people participating online. And nice. Um, I'll, uh, I'll let you know if we get any questions. OK. Any questions in-house? People online can hear the question. When you were speaking about emotional reasoning, I started wondering where does the intuition fit into the picture? You know, like when people say, trust your gut. If mm -hmm. you're walking into a dangerous situation or there's passive aggressive or something's going on that you're picking up signals, but they're not really evident. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, some people, again, if we think in terms of balance or spectrum, some people are highly focused on the cognitive end. If I was to be doing um, uh, something like the ABC model in terms of breaking down thoughts, feelings, behaviors, triggers, all that, they would be able to reflect on a situation and with great detail tell me how they were thinking. But they might not be able to actually identify more than a feeling or two. And sometimes it's vice versa. They can, they, can, they can tell me 10, 12 different emotions, but, it, but they can't reflect on what the internal dialogue was. So when I think about intuition, absolutely, that's important. And sometimes it's not as easily explained as just like, well, this is a rational thought or an irrational thought. Something is more, it's a little deeper or innate. And so it's a, it's a great question. If we're talking about safety in a situation, absolutely. I think I would encourage people to be able to listen to that. And, and, and not ignore it. But generally, it, it, it's hard to sometimes decipher, is this, is this feeling in my gut a result of me thinking and worrying, or is this something, something beyond that? So it, it's, in any of those situations, I would want someone to take a breath and kind of check with themselves. I mean, the biggest thing with intuition is someone who just shoves it away and says, no, that's silly, that's illogical, I'm being, you know, I'm just, they label themselves in some way. So I would want them to notice it because it is an, another important part of the, 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 the whole sense of responses and, and knowing yourself and knowing what's fueling your responses. So I don't have a, a, a clear-cut answer for that other than it is an important thing and to actually to acknowledge it, but to know that they're all influencing each other. If we're in a negative headspace, it's going to affect how we're thinking. And if we're thinking in a negative way, we're going to maybe behave differently. Like, you know, these things pile on each other. If, um, if I woke up feeling, you know, I didn't have a good sleep, well then, yeah, maybe I skip breakfast and, and then I go to work in a rush and then I don't do good work and then I beat myself up for it. So then instead of going to the gym after work, I just go home and crack a bottle of wine and watch Netflix. And then I beat up on myself because I, <laughs> I missed the workout and I didn't do good work that day. So it, it tends to go that way and it can go the other way in a positive way too. So. Uh, yeah, we, we need to be able to factor those in. And, and the reality is a lot of people don't actually spend a lot of time explore, exploring intuition. Um, but I do think it's an important thing to factor in for sure. Thank you. I have a question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is my own, not anybody's online. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very fortunate to be working with counselors. It's a very well-adjusted team to be working with. <laughs> um, and you were mentioning earlier that um, uh, you know, when, when we have this negative filter, we're, we're listening at like the confirmation bias of, ooh. Mm -hmm. um, how would you, like what kind of language would you approach that other person to say, hey, can you like, explain that? Or <laughs> ah, so that's a good question. So what, what we call that is perception checking. To have the, the willingness first to actually just acknowledge that this is what I'm thinking happened, but I don't know. And a lot of people just jump to a conclusion and then they hold on to it. 
So to be able to perception check means even having the, will, the ability to say, you know what, I might think that that's why that person ate the last cupcake. That might be why they didn't say hi when I walked by. But I don't know for sure. So what I'm going to do is actually yeah, go up to them and say, hey, by the way, when you asked me that question in the meeting, or when you said that, this is the story I created. And I just wanted to check it out with you, what was really going on for you there. Now, a lot of people find discomfort with that. They, they just assume the person will be like, what? <laughs> but for me, I always really appreciate when someone, whether it's a coworker or a friend, comes up and says that because I can't solve the misunderstanding if they don't tell me one's happening. So I actually find it very respectful of our relationship when someone says, by the way, I was a little put off when this happened, but this is what, what happened, and this is the, what I, where I took it. But I just wanted to check with you if that's actually accurate. In which case, they're, then they're giving me the chance to actually say, oh, okay, I can see why you were acting like you were a little upset there, or I, I noticed that, I didn't know why. Thanks for letting me know. Here's what was actually going on and why I said that and what I meant to try to put out there. Thanks, that's a good one. Um, this is kind of in a similar line to the question that came from over there. First of all, love CBT. It's the only kind of talk therapy that I've ever really connected with. Um, was listening to a podcast a couple of years ago, Invisibilia from NPR. It's really mm -hmm. cool. It deals with a lot of this stuff. Um, but they talked about the shift in therapy approaches from kind of the original psychodynamic ones into CBT and how that blew up. And just almost any therapist you could see in the last few decades was practicing CBT. Mm -hmm. And they implied that there's a shift now that we will see kind of in that two years ago space into the next 10 years towards mindfulness-based therapy. Yeah. And I've always found this bit of a... I don't know, it's a paradox with mindfulness and CBT. CBT is looking at your thinking, tearing it apart, breaking into little pieces and saying, do those pieces make sense? Yeah. And mindfulness is the opposite. It's saying, stop thinking, clear your brain, and let that be the way you deal with this. How do you address that paradox or disparity? How do you combine mindfulness and CBT to an effective you know, combined treatment? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was fortunate enough um, when I was at Vancouver Parole, um, and you might, you might be familiar with dialectical behavior therapy. Um, so I worked as a skills trainer with, uh, with the women's unit for, in, uh, for parole in New Westminster. And that's really about balancing some sort of East, some Eastern philosophies around mindfulness with the cognitive behavioral component. I don't see them as like opposed. I think maybe some do who are like staunchly like, I'm cognitive behavioral therapist. Like, but I, I've, I've always tried to take a lot, a little bit of here and there. Which is, I think, why I danced around your question a little bit, because CBT can be a little rigid in terms of like thoughts, feelings, behaviors. And a felt sense of something that's hard to explain, even deeper spiritual sort of questions. Like, I mean, some of these things are hard to, to sort of mesh together. Um, but, I mean, the best way I can say that is that I don't think you can, you can even do great cognitive behavioral reflection if it's coming through a lens of judgment already, of like, that's a good feeling, that's a bad feeling, or I should, like, I think sometimes that's done in such a, um, in just such, such concrete terms um, that, it, it, that, that there is room to be able to just say, that's what I'm thinking, that's what I'm feeling, and I don't need to fix it. I don't need to solve it like a riddle, as if it's not okay. It, it, it is okay. And I'd always say to people, like, just like, you, can't, you can't solve something that you don't even know is happening yet. So first, even just to be able to take a moment to breathe and to be mindful and to acknowledge, you know what, I, I noticed I kind of snapped at my son there. I was a little impatient there. I wonder what's going on. If I come home and my wife is like, if I, like, just re reach, like, meets me at the door like a buzzsaw and it's just like, ah, ah, I'd like, you know. And, you know, the, the first reaction might be like, whoa, oh, don't talk to me like that, and I don't deserve that, why would you do that? Like, and to, to defend and then counterattack, right? Uh, in a staff meeting we recently had, I actually gave the example, I think, to, to Sarah, I think, and I said, at my best, I'll look past the behavior of what I'm seeing, and I'll get curious about what's underneath it. So instead of saying, like, this behavior's wrong, I'll say, I'll get curious about what's going on. There must be some wound under there because your anger is just the show. But there's some other primary feelings going on and if, if she doesn't know or, and she can't talk about it, then I can't help her with it. So I need to spend some time actually being curious and say, I see that you're overwhelmed. I might not say <laughs> angry because that could <laughs> be triggered. I, I see that something's going on. I want to help you. What's going on? I'm here to listen. Let's talk about it. 
And I think that that's where sort of, and I hope that answers your question a little bit, where I think there's, there's room to be mindful first and during, but first in order to access what those true sort of thoughts, feelings, and behaviors are. Because if we don't, we can just quickly get into labeling saying, I shouldn't be this way. I'm supposed to be happy. <laughs> I'm supposed to be joyful. I'm supposed to be like appreciative. I'm so, you know, but to be able to actually even know what we're feeling then allows us to actually get curious about what we need and how we can ask for help or do what we need to do to feel better. I have a question online. Yay. How do we help someone who is experiencing cognitive distortion themselves? For example, if I'm an instructor and I see something happening in my students around assignment stress or perfectionism. Uh, uh, you know, it, it's hard to answer that. It depends, it depends which one. If someone comes in and they're thinking in terms of like very black and white, success, failure, you know, then you know, I might ask questions a little bit around how they define success and like just try to, un I, would always, I would say to an, to an instructor just like I would to a therapist uh, in the same way, like get curious about what's going on and what's, what's, what's feeding that emotion and that, that struggle. Uh, if we start to label or finger point and be like, really sounds like you're using some should statements there. The, the person might feel a little attacked as opposed to receptive of, oh, maybe you have some feedback or seeing this through a different lens that might help me. So to be able to just have a conversation to say, like, I, I see that, again, I see that you're overwhelmed. You know, what's going on? Is there some, is there some other backstory to this? Are we using some perfectionist self-talk around uh, that's, that's causing you to, to, to get overwhelmed and so focus on what you don't want? or your fears that you can't even focus on how to en enjoy the process of learning or to just focus on doing your best and, and give yourself credit for that. So it really does depend on which distortion, but I guess I would never start a conversation, even myself, someone coming in within seven minutes be like, I've identified the thinking error <laughs> and I know how to fix it. <laughs> you should really do this or do that. So I would never do that. Okay, last chance. Okay. <laughs> I really should ask that question. Oh, I'm such a jerk. I'm not far away. If you do have any questions, whoa. Uh, if you guys do have any questions, it's totally fine. You don't have to ask here. You know where I am. Uh, if you don't, then I'm in the library in <laughs> room 117. Uh, but feel free. The email was there. Reach out if you have any questions, similar to what the instructor asked. I love when the instructors come and ask questions. Uh, or any of the staff, because the, the more informed you guys are, the better we're all going to be able to support students, and that's really part of the initiative that we're looking at in terms of mental health as a whole institution. So there's no bad questions. Feel free to come to me with anything, and if I can help or Gemma can help, uh, we will. Will you be sending your stuff out? Oh, thank you. Um, uh, belated warning, uh, this is being live streamed and recorded and I'm going to be sending out the link so when you tell all of your workers or your, your peers and all the students how wonderful this session was, you can share it. Um, <laughs> we'll also have it posted on, we're creating a resource uh, page for these things so that they live on and on. Um, any other questions? Thank you so much for coming and thank you so much for caring. <laughs> Thank you for coming. <laughs> I hope you see at the very least that our counselors are awesome. They're real people. And my message to the staff here who don't have access to our student counselors, um, that we have really great um, counselors for staff through our, what, what's it called? The Wellms Walmsley, yes. And I encourage you to um, take better care of yourselves than you take care of your cars. So you take that for regular maintenance, right? <laughs> I want you to take yourself for regular maintenance. Don't wait till the check engine light comes on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's, there's some really good stuff that they can help with. And it's not just somebody sitting there saying, so how does that make you feel? <laughs> <laughs> Which I would never say, because things don't make us feel anything. No. <laughs> right? It's a powerless statement. As a powerless yeah. statement. OK. <laughs> Well, go forward and have a cupcake and a pamphlet on your way out about the student mental health framework. And be good to yourselves and be good to others. Thank you. Bye.